as we're just connecting to the recording now. All right, excellent. Okay, everyone. Um, my name is Beryl Oldham, and I am the uh, board chair for the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to this Knowledge Hour. Um, we're very privileged to have Dr. Robin Mann, who has uh, I would say is the most experienced uh, business excellence person in New Zealand, and we're proud to have him on the board with us as well. He's kindly present, uh, agreed to present at our first um, webinar, and uh, we hope to be running uh, new webinars about every six weeks going forward, and uh, hopefully at some point we'll get to the point we can, we can plan some events again as well. Uh, if you'd like to have a look at our uh, website, um, I will send out the link when I send out the video recording but we have revamped our website and we are now offering uh, some training opportunities and also uh, we will be offering consulting going forward as well. So uh, New Zealand Business Excell Excellence Foundation is alive and well and I'm very proud to be part of it. Now I'm going to uh, turn my video cam off now and I'll let Robin uh, take over at this point and I hope you all enjoy the session. Uh, I will, we will be taking questions at the end, about the last 15 minutes. I will be checking um, the, chat, the chat, uh, chat box as it comes up and uh, I'll be making a note of the questions and we can all have a, a question and answer session at the end. And once again, whoever's joined us recently, we are recording the session, so we will be able to get that to you afterwards. All right, Robin, I'm handing over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Beryl, and uh, welcome to this webinar, wherever you are in the world. It's, say, 11 o'clock in the morning in New Zealand, but uh, I'm sure some of you are working from the day before, especially in Chile and Costa Rica. So my presentation is on business excellence, best practices and benchmarking. I'm going to try and make it as interesting as possible by particularly talking about the work of my centre over the last year, so bringing in a lot of relevant information, practical work that uh, will hopefully enable you to, to, to apply in, in your workplace. Um, so for those who don't know, uh, the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research, it was formed in the year 2000. Um, it's in three parts, so there's three, 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 three entities really, which are part of this umbrella term called the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research. One is Cohen Massey University, where we do research on acquiring knowledge and organizational excellence. Another is BPR.com Limited, where we share that knowledge through a best practice website portal. And thirdly, Cohen Limited, where we apply that knowledge through consultancy and training and, and events. Uh, I actually live in uh, Wanganui, which is in the North Island of New Zealand. In fact, I live close to Wanganui, maybe 35 kilometers away. Um, in uh, quite a remote area. So I, I, I always self-isolate, self whether irrespective of whether there's a, a, a pandemic or not. But I have researchers and consultants in, in New Zealand working with me and also internationally. And I probably spend six months of my time overseas each year. Um, so I'm going to go through the work of um, each of the, the entities associated with COA, starting off with uh, Massey University and our research team there. So we have three PhD researchers. Uh, it's very important that our PhD research do practical research that ultimately organisations or business associations or government can use. Uh, so I'm going to talk about their research projects first of all. So I'll start with uh, Saad Gafour's research, which is called Excellence Without Borders. And this research is supported by the Global Excellence Model Council, which consists of those um, bodies which represent uh, unique business excellence models around the world. So the Baldridge, uh, the National Institute of Standard Technology, uh, who um, represent the Baldridge Model of the United States, part of that Global Excellence Model Council, you know, the EFQM, uh, we have Singapore, we have Japan, we have Malaysia, we have Australia. So this Global Excellence Model Council su supports this research because this research that Sarah's doing is extremely important. What he's looking at is how different countries are promoting business excellence and trying to engage organizations in the excellence journey. So we can learn why some countries are more successful in promoting business excellence than, than in others. Um, 
you can find information from obviously more information from these website links you can see on the slides here i'll share the slides uh, later on uh, when Saad started his actual research he did, did some sort of background reading i guess and uh, he kicked that off by just trying to look at what previous research has been done academically on business excellence from which he found has been 382 papers Again, I provide the link where you can find information and all that research has been done in the past in business excellence since 1990. What's pleasing is that my center is uh, produced more academic papers than any other research institution around the world on business excellence. Uh, we can also see other research here, which is sharing information that 55 countries have a business excellence award. This is an active award that's been running either in the last two years or they're planning to run an award this year. And another 18 countries uh, promote business excellence, but do not have an active award at the moment. So New Zealand is included in that setting second category. So in total, you know, 73 countries are promoting business excellence, which is, um, you know, more than a third of the countries worldwide. But again, what we wanted to learn from, for instance, from our New Zealand colleagues here is you know, why are some of these other countries more successful than perhaps New Zealand in having an active awards program, but also getting great sort of excitement engagement where you're wanting organizations to use these models to, to improve their productivity and competitiveness. So with respect to Saad's research, he's really looking at the role of the business excellence custodians. Therefore, you know, what frameworks are they using and also how do they deploy those frameworks? And this is really the key aspect, aspect here is how do you create excitement and awareness around the framework? How do you enable organizations to use those, those frameworks and be able to improve their performance? So when they're assessed against those frameworks, I think they can show a greater level of maturity in terms of business excellence. And finally, you know, what is their approach for assessing organizations for excellence and giving out the major awards for their particular country. And the reason why countries do this and why they're focusing on excellence is because we know that it produces a significant improvement in the management practice and performance of organizations. A huge amount of research, research has been done on this uh, from both an organizational perspective and a national perspective so that we know that excellence works but often it's a case of, you know, how do we create that awareness? How do we help organizations on that journey to excellence? And again, this is something we want to learn as New Zealanders, how other countries are getting more organizations on this journey to, to excellence. In New Zealand, we use a Baldrige framework, which you can see here. And this is again, a very sensible approach. It's, it's uh, more sensible to adopt an international framework rather than design one yourself because then a lot of time has to be spent on validating that framework. And, uh, and apart from that, organizations now you know, compete globally. It's a global marketplace. And these internationally recognized frameworks you know, uh, are well known. And so they'll assist any organization which is you know, trying to sell its products and services uh, overseas. Uh, for his research, he's had 26 countries involved, and uh, you can see the, the countries here. So New Zealand was not involved because it does not have an, does not have an active awards program at the moment. And uh, so research was very intensive where he asked each country to complete uh, this, this, a survey which would take maybe between three and six hours to complete. So it's a very thorough survey completed by the business access custodians. And then that was followed up by structured interviews in many of those countries. Uh, again, through that link shown on, on this slide, you can access the initial findings from the research. But I'd like to share with you just on this slide some of the uh, what I believe is quite exciting findings. Uh, this slide here shows when he asked the business excellence custodian what services they were providing for awards assistance and awareness and he was asking you know does a business excellence custodian perceive those services uh, to be you know well received services or are they providing them in such a fashion that they're getting a good response from those services or not 
So they had to record whether they believe their own services were very poor, poor, average, good or excellent. And you can see when they're providing their awards service, which is how they assess organisations applying for the awards, on average they were rating themselves as 3.8, which is you know, good for most of those particular processes. So site visits to award applicants undertaken by assessors with scoring 4.3, award ceremony 4.2, consensus meetings again is rated ex extremely highly the judging panel etc but when we come to the next area which is looking at you know how do those business access custodians assist organizations on that journey you know what what um, services do they provide to assist them and how do they rate those services uh, they assess them as slightly lower as an average 3.3 and you can see the, the areas where there are opportunities for improvement are on things like online social, online social platform for, for sharing between various organizations, industry-specific industry business excellence guides, online service database of business excellence information and publications, uh, opportunities for sharing and learning from organizations in other countries. So these were the weak areas that they're thinking that they could improve more on in the future. But overall, the message to take from this is that they're, they're more confident in the award processes they provided rather than the services they provided to help organisations on a journey. And then when we look at the services they provided for promoting excellence, again, these were rated even lower. So as an average of 3.1, which is just about average, that means many of their services they believe are below average. And when we can look at those services, they look at that you can read them as encouraging industry membership-based associations to promote business excellence to their members, encouraging tertiary institutions to promote and teach business excellence to their students, encouraging schools to promote and teach business excellence to their pupils, press releases on business excellence, obtaining the assistance of consultants to promote business excellence. So these are opportunities for improvement, big opportunities for improvement. And I think this is so this is the average from all those 26 countries so this what this shows to me is that all those countries have, have concentrated the majority of their effort and resources on their awards process itself to make sure it's robust and rigorous and you know this is understandable but they've had less time and energy and resources to focus on these other areas and this, I think, reflects the New Zealand situation as well. I mean, to actually win a solid awards process, you need to have at least probably five full-time staff in that business ex custodian just doing that administration of that whole process. And, when, and in some countries like in New Zealand, even at its peak of business excellence, the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation probably only had about six or seven full-time staff. And therefore, not enough time was devoted to helping organisations on the journey and creating awareness, which means over time that perhaps interest in business excellence will decline unless you're addressing awareness and assistance. Countries which are more successful will have put more effort over time on awareness and assistance, where everybody inside that country, all institutions, understand excellence. And so this is why they can sustain business excellence over the long term. So this is a sort of interesting information that SAD is researching to find out why some countries are more successful or not. Is it because they're engaging with uh, other industry bodies inside the country? Is it because they're working with universities? Is it because of government funding, et cetera? Uh, moving on next to our ne next, the next research, this is by Atif. And he's looking at the organizational exit excellence architecture required to accelerate an organization's business excellence journey. Therefore, if you're starting off in business excellence, what do you need to put in place? You know, what infrastructure is required to make it successful? Do you need to have a full-time person on working on business excellence? Do you need to hire a consultant to assist you on that journey? You know, what assessment tools you should, should you be using? Should you be using self-assessments or facilitated assessments? or external assessments. Um, in, in terms of, you know, the, 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 how you engage your leadership in this, you know, how should this whole approach be led? Should it be led by the CEO, senior management team? How much time should they devote to this? Surprisingly, there has been no previous research on this. 
And so this is very, very important research. I know from my working with organizations around the world that this, they vary enormously in terms of their organizational excellence architecture. I've seen some organizations with over a thousand, sorry, with over a hundred people in a business excellence department facilitating this whole process, while other organizations of a similar size of having maybe 10,000 employees just have three or four people dedicated to business excellence. So as part of this research, Atif is going to uh, be involving business excellence award winners from around the world and finding out what is their organizational excellence architecture and how that's varied on the journey to excellence because the organizational excellence architecture might vary dependent on your level of maturity, it might vary dependent on your organizational size, it might vary even on the industry you're working in. So again, if you're interested in that research, please contact Atif because he's going to be sending out a survey quite soon. He's particularly looking for organizations which have been on the journey for some time. The third research project we're doing is with uh, Ranjita Singh. This is really looking at best practices in positive workplace culture. Therefore, you know, how to uh, make a workplace have, have a more positive, uh, positive, positive uh, culture. The reason why this is important is because workplace positivity is a key component of employee engagement and high levels of employee engagement result in higher levels you know, of, of productivity. And it, the, the research here would be looking at whether um, you know, organizations can influence the level of employee positivity through uh, introducing various you know, HR processes, initiatives, whatever they may be. So for Ranjita's research, she's really looking for HR directors and managers to contact her who wish to be part of this survey and this is particularly important in the time of recovery from, from COVID, looking at what interventions are in place to you know, motivate uh, employees and to have them have a positive outlook. It could be simple things, just, just as having a regular daily meeting with um, your, your employees and setting aims and objectives, or it could be more comprehensive in terms of um, you know, the whole training program, trying to develop the competencies of, of staff. So she's wanting as many organizations as possible to sign up to her research. In addition to getting the views of HR managers and directors, uh, she's also wanting organizations, if, if they can, and this is optional, to encourage their, their staff to complete um, a survey which will measure the level of employee positivity inside the workplace. And she would like those organizations to participate, not only now, but again in six months time to see whether there's been over changes when we've been, when we've been recovering from COVID. And then from that data, she'll be able to correlate that with the interventions on um, uh, workplace um, positivity. So please contact her if you're interested. So that's sort of an overview of the sort of the research we're doing at the moment. In terms of the work we do in terms of sharing best practices around the world, that's done through the bpr.com uh, best practice uh, resource. Uh, this is free for New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation members, um, up to two passwords per member, depending on uh, um, your, your level of membership with the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation. Uh, this resource has got thousands of best practices in it. It's got lots of tools, techniques, and approaches you can use to improve performance. All the information can be filtered by uh, the business excellence models. Uh, we're currently going through a revision of the website. The new website will be launched in um, hopefully August, September this year. So whilst we have, whilst you can filter all the information through the models you can see here at the moment, these are quite dated, to be honest. So they're old versions of the Baldridge model, EFQM model, et cetera. With a new website, we'll have the, 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 the up-to-date EFQM model, up-to-date Baldridge model. We'll also be adding other models like the African Excellence model as well, uh, the Australian model. So whichever part of the world you're in, uh, this will be particularly useful to you if you're trying to improve against uh, the, the, the business excellence model criteria. Not only that, uh, we have it's a huge amount of resources inside this website. We have submission documents of award winners so you can learn from them. We have videos of 
organizations sharing their best practices. So it's uh, well worth a look if you're trying to improve performance. Um, uh, also, we're very proud of our best practice reports we produce. We produce generally about 10 per year. Uh, we've written well over 100 by now, and we started a new series at the end of last year just focused on business excellence. So we're producing uh, best practice reports not only for each category of excellence, but also the items underneath each category. So in total, we'll have over 30 reports, which means if you're reading these and learning from the best practices, it really provides you with the guidelines of how to achieve world-class performance. Each report is very simple to read, generally about 12 pages long, all very practical information linked to videos, linked to additional information. So as you can see here, there's an example of the contents of the report focused on leadership and on vision, mission and values. So that's the BPR.com for you. Now moving quickly on now to the consultancy and training work we do through uh, Coa Limited. Um, uh, uh, we, we run, uh, apart from consultancy, we run major events around the world like the International Best Practice Competition. We actually founded this initially in New Zealand when uh, I was a co-founder of the World Quality Congress in 2012. That was in partnership with the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation and the New Zealand Organization for Quality. And since then, so we've taken the, the, this concept around the world. We were going to have an event this year, but uh, it's been delayed. I'm not sure we might be able to do it digitally by the end of this year, or we'll probably do it digitally early ne next, next year. Uh, other events run recently was the uh, Global Organization Elections Congress in Abu Dhabi. I was working with the Abu Dhabi Chamber, and we had one, over 1,300 1, attendees at that. And again, you go to the website link there, and it's, you can actually download the presentations of the speakers. And it's got some great presentations you know, from uh, the EFQM and various award bodies around the world and what they're doing in terms of uh, business excellence. Uh, so in terms of consultancy in the last year, what we've been work, working on is assisting uh, uh, a number of countries with uh, business excellence approaches and productivity approaches. We've been doing work on behalf of the Asian Productivity Organization, working with the Bangladesh National Productivity Organization and the Mongolian National Productivity Organization, looking at the, the, the overall strategy of those organizations and the services they provide and whether or not you know, they're having a good impact in terms of raising productivity in their particular countries. Um, in, in the case of Bangladesh, Bangladesh got a population of 140 million people. Just in uh, uh, Dhaka alone, it's got a population of over 20 million people. So it's... Uh, it's 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 got it's got it's got a lot of people, and as you can see from this picture, it's also got a lot of traffic. So um, when when we when we're sort of do, doing this work, looking at uh, the, the work of the National Productivity Organization, uh, the National Productivity Organization just as is a, out of interest is similar to what the, the work the NZT does in New Zealand, New Zealand Trades and Enterprise. So when we're looking at the work the MPO was doing uh, on productivity, it was very much at a very limited scope. So their view of productivity really was just, it was primarily on providing you know, old style productivity tools and techniques, um, plan, do, check, action, 5S, Lean, Six Sigma. And really the impact on productivity inside that country had been very, very um, limited because of the limited scope of, 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 of um, it, it's a strategy, really. And yet when we look at this picture, we can see straight away there's going to be productivities in, 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 in Bangladesh uh, with traffic congestion like that, which is absolutely abysmal, absolutely abysmal. Just going a couple of kilometers can take, 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 take an hour. That that's really affecting productivity in Dhaka. So what that organization should be doing more of is facilitating projects just trying to find best practices in tackling traffic congestion because that will solve one of the biggest productivity issues in in that country so it's trying to get them thinking differently about how to tackle productivity and engage relative partners and engage partners to to tackle major issues um, uh, like that 
And the other key thing here was that uh, both the National Productivity Organization of Bangladesh and uh, Mongolia were using a national were using a business excellence award. They had a business excellence award. They called them a productivity award, and which is right to do. So, so when we look at productivity, productivity is the value of output over the value of input. So it's trying to get more with less. Really, it's essentially what a business excellence model is, is doing. You've got inputs and outputs. So the inputs are you know, the enablers, leadership strategy, customer focus, HR, operations, you know, and uh, uh, measurement, information and knowledge. And when we improve in those areas, we're going to improve um, our, our results. So this is really, the, the, the actual business framework is really the ultimate productivity tool. And so I, I asked a question to the, to the MPOs. I, I asked them, do you believe that this is a good award that you have, which truly represents productivity and, is, and can provide sort of a role model of what productivity should be for an organization in terms of how to manage productivity? And I said, yes, of course, you know, we agree with that. But then when we looked at the services they're providing, they were not aligned to the model itself. And so this was getting them away to think about really as a national productivity organization, we should be providing services in all these areas, not just in the operations area, looking at a very limited spectrum of productivity tools and training. They should be providing uh, tools, techniques, services in leadership, strategy, customers, HR, etc. And in some cases, there might be other institutions which are providing services in that area. So they could, could say, okay, we're not going to provide services, but we'll work with other institutions to make sure we cover all aspects of this. What's important about this is that it's also important from a New Zealand context because New Zealand strongly promotes productivity. There is a productivity commission, but I don't believe that they uh, really understand business excellence models or are aware of them. And really as uh, New Zealanders, if we're trying to promote competitiveness and productivity, then you need to have a guide, you need to have a role model, you need to be able to provide some guides on how to achieve that without the business excellence framework and without role model organizations, there is no guide, there is no best practice. So this is why it's absolute key the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation survives and not only flourishes, because it provides the best practices on how to achieve uh, national you know, competitiveness and productivity of, of, of the country. Uh, so these were the questions I was asking Bangladesh, how strong are the inputs to productivity within Bangladesh? And when we think about this, and we then need to, uh, from a national perspective, we need to think about how do we arrange, uh, how do we encourage awareness, again, of business excellence productivity? How do we help organizations on the journey? And then how do we recognize organizations which are world class, which are going to become the role models? And this, this is really how this sort of consultancy ties into Atif's research that he's doing for the Global Excellence Model Council because you know, he's studying this, what other countries, what countries around the world are doing. So countries really to be successful, they need to be providing assessment services at each stage of the journey towards excellence and capability building services. And these are just examples of sort of generic capability building services to help organizations to improve. And not only that, you would need to provide both assessment services and capability services as well for each category of excellence. So this is what the NZBF needs to be a leader in, is in educating the various institutions, especially New Zealand government, saying this needs to happen. And, uh, and, and the New Zealand Business Foundation could have more resource to facilitate parts of this. It can't do everything, of course. It's got to work with other institutions. So I now want to talk about another aspect of Kerr's work, which is on benchmarking. Um, um, I, I founded what's called the Trade Best Practice Benchmarking Methodology or developed it um, around the year 2000 to 2004. I was running the New Zealand Benchmarking Club, which is a partnership between the Centre for Organisational Excellence Research and the New Zealand Business Excellence Foundation that was run with the premier organisation in New Zealand at the time. Um, since then, the, the trade methodology has been used all around the world. So it's a very easy methodology to follow. It's very systematic. Um, 
it's 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 uh, in, in, indeed more prescriptive than you'd find other benchmarking methodologies which is a good point because it shows you exactly what you need to do when you do a benchmarking project so it consists of five stages as you can see here but underneath each of these stages are steps so plan the project identify what you want to do the benchmarking on review the current situation acquire best practices deploy them and evaluate what i think is not understood is that Benchmarking, you know, to me is the most powerful change management tool because normally when you do benchmarking project, you, it's set up with a benchmarking team. You have a project team undertaking the project and it because it's, it's, it be, it, it's helping them on really on a learning journey. And when you do benchmarking project, it's not just involving the project team. The project, project team should be involving all the stakeholders. The stakeholders are responsible for the process and the customers and suppliers were affected by the process. So benchmarking project is taking the team and all the stakeholders on a learning journey to understand what the problem is, to, to work together on finding best practices, plus also providing their own ideas on what needs to do, be done to improve. And then together deciding then what needs to be implemented and then evaluating the outcomes. So it's, so it's about changing people's mindsets change and, and taking everybody on, on this journey. And this is how you get true innovation because you're involving your team, you're involving your stakeholders, it's getting people's ideas, plus also you're visiting other organizations, you're learning totally unique ways of approaching a particular problem. So it's changing ways of thinking, which gives you, let's say, new concepts, new ideas, whether or not you're going to replicate something they're going to do or not. So normally in, in a benchmarking project, you would expect to get between at least 50 to maybe 120 great ideas and best practices. And then it's a matter of sifting through them and prioritizing them, which ones you're going to implement. So this is where you get fast change, quick wins, breakthrough wins, breakthrough changes. Um, absolutely fantastic. So uh, in the last few words, I've been working predominantly um, on benchmarking in the UAE, working with the Dubai government. I've helped uh, with the Dubai government support, facilitated 34 projects. Actually, many more projects have been undertaken than that. It's also worked independently with organizations as well. Uh, but, but these are examples of benchmarking projects. Some are really big, which are gonna have societal changes in the UAE. Other ones are more specific. So a big project would be, for instance, about addressing the prevalence of diabetes in the community so reducing the likelihood of people getting diabetes through um, you know, having a healthier uh, lifestyle other projects are more specific about just trying to tackle employer happiness within a specific government entity so it can be big projects or small projects a recent project last year was looking at um, uh, making Dubai the safest place in the world to have a heart attack. So if you look at Copenhagen and Seattle, your survival rates from a heart attack outside hospital are 65%. In most countries like in New Zealand, in the UAE, it'd be between five to 10%. And so this project is learning from best practices around the world. So ultimately Dubai will be even better than Seattle and Copenhagen. So uh, absolutely fantastic life-changing uh, projects. What, I, what I'll do is share with you how we sort of organize a program for this, because you could do a similar program inside your own organization if you're a large organization, or again, we could even think about how we could do something uh, perhaps in New Zealand engaging lots of organizations. Um, most years we have between 10 to 15 projects which we start off at the same time. So. Um, they have to put forward projects and we, we determine which one should, should proceed and be part of the program itself. But they start off with a, with a training program so they all understand what benchmarking is. Then we have a schedule of activities for, for one year. Um, in fact, for this last year in 2019, we only had a nine month program, which is very, very ambitious to be able to manage uh, big projects in such a short time frame but this was because Dubai Expo was planned for 2020 so we need to complete them in nine months uh, so this is a schedule you can see training at the start they all need to submit trade spreadsheets as they pursue the project this is a project management system so we can monitor the progress of the projects in real time uh, 
we have regular site visit meetings to each government entity, two hours each meeting, understanding more in depth the problem and the issues and how and providing advice and benchmarking. Every two to three months there'd be knowledge sharing summits where all the different teams come together and share their progress with the benchmarking projects. These are fantastic because they're all learning from each other on, on how to do benchmarking, the sharing best practices, and many of them become benchmarking partners for each other too. Um, we also do sp special sharing for and, and activities for team leaders and benchmarking facilitators so they can share experiences uh, as well. And at the end of the year, we have a final knowledge sharing summit and awards day where we have international judges to come to assess the projects and each project as well has got to write a very detailed and comprehensive benchmarking report and, and we assess them. And then six months later, we write a book which shares all the, uh, the case studies from, from, from those uh, projects. So you can see here some photographs from the uh, knowledge sharing summits in Dubai. Um, we can see photographs of some of the activities that we undertake. Um, and you can see that this is the, the trade project management system. It's, we use Excel spreadsheets because everybody's familiar with Excel. And you can see at the bottom of the slide, different tabs for the worksheets. Uh, there's over 40 different tabs here, which are really different tools and methods you can use, which are gonna assist you when you do a benchmarking project. What you're seeing in front of you now is it's just part of the terms of reference for a project. Uh, you can see here the planning they do for the review stage of trade. It's got the steps associated with each stage on the left hand side and then what they're actually doing. And then this is showing some of the tools they use as part of the benchmarking project, like fishbone analysis, process mapping, best practice selection uh, matrix, etc. So at the end of the year, we assess the projects. For this year in December, when it came to an end, we had three seven star projects and the rest were five, six stars or three to four stars. If the three to four stars, it means I've done a professional job. Uh, and this was very demanding to do in a nine month time frame. Those ones of which are three to four stars, five to six stars, they could still become seven star projects. Uh, it's just at the time of assessing them, they were not seven stars. Some of them needed more time to implement their best practices. What we'd said to all the organizations is that they need to at least have implemented some quick wins by the end of the year. But obviously some are implementing major change programs and needed uh, additional time. So we have Dubai police here, for instance, uh, their project was looking at increasing the security of checked in luggage, which, which, uh, which, which goes onto the airplanes. And for this particular project, uh, now because of greater s security and changes to the process, means now there's less delayed air, uh, airline departures uh, because of security issues, which is saving the airlines 18 million US dollars per year just from this project alone. It also increase the productivity of the, the, the baggage screeners as well. For Dubai municipality, their project was reducing the tendering time from once a tender is issued to issuing the contract. That they reduce their average time from 99 days and 33 days is going to go even faster than that, which is saving their organization between 10 to 20 million US dollars per annum. Dubai Corporation for Ambulance Service is trying to be the most innovative uh, ambulance service in the world. So their job initially is just developing an innovation blueprint of what innovation would look like. They can't achieve that in one year. It's going to, they, they've set an objective achieving by achieving that by 2021 but they've made great strides to achieving it. They've improved their innovation maturity score from 46% to 64% and received gold accreditation for innovation management. So wonderful achievements by the team. teams. When you see the teams do these projects, you see changes in the individuals because they've never been through such a development program like this. Um, so it's, it's a fantastic initiative to be part of. Uh, to find information on previous projects, again, I've got the links here. So this provides full information on all the projects. And again, in the bpr.com website, you can see presentations on the projects uh, too. Because of the success of uh, the fourth cycle, the, sorry, the third cycle of Dubai, we learn in the previous cycles, um, we we're actually not planning to do a fourth cycle this year because of Dubai Expo uh, happening. Uh, but... Uh, we were contacted by Dubai government in April, just uh, uh, last month, saying that because they understand the power of the benchmarking methodology, can we do a benchmarking project to assist the Executive Council's Crisis and Disaster Management Committee for COVID-19? 
So uh, we've quickly to put together a benchmarking project um, to assist um, the Executive Council's Crisis and Disaster Management Committee. Um, and, and to do this, we thought, okay, this has got to be a very fast project. It's got to, because you know, the situation's evolving all the time. So the project's going to be about one and a half, two months long. And we really needed people familiar with the trade methodology. So we selected people to be part of this team who have been, who've undertaken a seven star project in the past. And then we're also uh, really selective about the organizations participating as well. Obviously we need organizations like the Dubai Corporation for Ambulance Services, Services, Dubai Health Authority. Also we wanted the Dubai Economic Department, uh, Dubai SME involved as well for the economic recovery, et cetera. So the benefits from doing this project are obviously going to be things like lives saved, health benefits, and obviously faster e economic recovery. So just to show you the methodology in a bit more detail, how we're doing this. So the terms of reference stage, this now is showing you the steps associated with that. Um, in terms of this particular project now, when we, when we started looking at this in a bit more detail, we said we can't have just one benchmarking team. We need five benchmarking teams and which will be devoted to particular pillars. So we've had five teams focusing on a different pillar, one on crisis management, one on health, because obviously that's a key issue, one on food security and supply chain, one on economy and one on societal behavior. And we've got set objectives, you know, with, with, with delivery dates of what we need to do, working through the trade, stage, trade, trade stages. Because the situation's evolving all the time with, with COVID and uh, you, we thought as well, even if, if, if the, the government were going to wait for two months for our, our, our response and recommendations, that's going to be too late. So each week we, we elevate some of the, the, the quick wins, the quick best practices back to the crisis uh, uh, committee, to the Crisis and Disaster Management Committee. So our, our team leader who's, who's responsible for the whole project is from Dubai Corporation for Ambulance Service. Each, each, each week she, she would report anything really important back to the, to, the, to the crisis team. But ultimately by the 9th of June, we need to complete the whole project and then there'll be um, presentations and uh, benchmarking reports to, to the actual uh, committee. So for the review stage, the review is fully understanding the current situation in Dubai with regards to the management of COVID. So therefore, they have been using techniques like SWOT analysis, fishbone analysis as well. So you can see here this fishbone analysis. This was by the, the crisis management subpillar, and you can see the fish eating a COVID virus. So that's what we're wanting. We don't want any more COVID viruses. And then what, what they do with the SWOT analysis, they do a, a, a fishbone analysis to understand the current situation. On that uh, fishbone analysis, it's broken down the subpillar, they've broken down the pillar, which is crisis management, into five subpillars. So this is the five subpillars that they think are important. Then they break that down then further into a gap analysis for each of the subpillars, thinking what are the current gaps? Because you need to know the current gaps because that'll help you to think about what best practices we need to find out. So when we come to the acquire stage, learning from other organizations, we use a very detailed best practice search form and approach to find best practices. So now they've broken down the pillar crisis management into these five sub pillars. And this is what we're going to do the searches on crisis leadership, effective media control, data control and management, effective and efficient utilization communication channel, future foresight and readiness. And you can see we break each of these areas down even further detail into a set of questions. And then we have researchers doing a lot of desktop research or even um, uh, uh, Skype and you know, Zoom meetings to, 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 to talk to other people to find, find, find the best, best practices. My core researchers have, have supported this uh, as well as the, the, the benchmarking teams in, in Dubai. From my core researchers, I think, uh, each co-researcher would write, find about 20 pages of information at least on, on best practices for the particular subpillar they're, they're looking at. For the subpillar of health, um, uh, 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 our researcher found 96 pages of information because there's so much information. So, and all this has been reported back uh, uh, to the benchmarking teams who need to then assess that information. 
what I just share with you is one of the searches that we did because it's interesting from a New Zealand perspective and it's showing, showing that in terms of the crisis management area and in terms of communication, then uh, New Zealand we feel is a particular best practice in terms of how the Prime Minister has been communicating to the public and how the um, Director of Health has been communicating on a daily basis and uh, also through the uh, four phase alert system it's very clear uh, to everybody in New Zealand. And this is not the same in all other countries. So not all other countries have a, a, a phase sort of a stage system. So we thought this, this was very powerful best practice which could, could be uh, learned, learned from. Um, so, so the five, next stage for the benchmarking teams is to give a presentation, submit a benchmarking report to the Crisis and Disaster Management Committee on the 9th of June 2020. So an awful lot of work is going into that and you can see how we're structuring the benchmarking report as well, where they're going to be sharing the title of the best practice idea, and, um, an overview of it, current state, recommendations, expected benefits and impact. And then finally, we'll do an evaluation of how successful the project has been. We'll do an internal evaluation and also get, this, get the feedback from um, um, the, the Committee of Crisis Disaster Management team itself. Maybe following on from this, there might also be additional projects. So I've talked a lot already about uh, the work we're doing in terms of benchmarking and other research. Um, again, I, I recommend you join the NZBF because you can access um, as well, the resources like the BPR.com and in the BPR.com resource, it's got all the information on trade, it's got training notes, you can see the spreadsheets we use so you can access in, in that information and you can see presentations from a, a younger me. Uh, hopefully they're okay. I don't like watching presentations to myself, maybe when I watch them I'd, I'd, I think I need to change it, who knows. Uh, what I want to leave you lastly with is just one short video, which is just five, five minutes, and then we'll open up for questions. And this is sharing um, the findings from a seven-star benchmarking project by uh, Dubai Police, which was completed in 2018. So after this video, I'll answer questions. Thank you very much. Dubai's police benchmarking project is carried through a unique benchmarking methodology called TRADE. In the terms of reference stage, the aim is to implement best practices in vehicle fleet maintenance to improve vehicle availability and labor productivity of the Dubai Police Mechanical Department to world-class levels. The Mechanical Department is one of the key operational departments of Dubai Police that focuses on the maintenance and repair of vehicles to ensure their optimum use. The department has seven main sections with more than 150 employees. The specific targets set were to increase productivity for the mechanical department from 40% to 70% and increase vehicle availability from 88% to 95%. In order to meet specific targets, Dubai Police Mechanical Department sets the following objectives. Identify the factors affecting the performance of the department, August 2017. Create an action plan, September 2017. Study best practices of other organizations, December 2017. Prepare and execute best practices, January 2018. Enhance productivity, vehicle availability, and production capacity, March 2018. During the review stage, the benchmarking team carries SWOT analysis, develops a fishbone diagram, and holds meetings with high-level employees and directors to understand the current performance, practices, and systems in order to define areas of improvement. A survey for technicians and employees at the lower grade is carried out to understand their perceptions of the factors affecting productivity and vehicle availability. Over 108 employees have completed the survey. After completion of the survey, the fishbone diagram was revised with the team identifying the following areas of focus. Spare parts management and storage. Equipment, material, tools. Manpower and labor capabilities. Management system and software. The team has identified performance measures as well as performed statistical analysis to set the average hours for the tasks using mode and median perimeters. At the beginning of the acquire stage, Dubai Police defined 13 criteria for the selection of potential benchmarking partners. 
At the start, the team identified 62 potential benchmarking partners. The team conducted nine site visits, At the end of this stage, the team identified the following. 31 best practices identified via site visits. 35 improvement ideas suggested by the benchmarking team. 86 best practices ideas reviewed, desktop research, site visits, and ideas. 23 best practices improvements ideas recommended for implementation. During deploy stage, all 35 improvement ideas are assessed based on a set criterion. Key activities implemented at this stage included data cleansing, closing the Burr Dubai mini workshop to improve efficiency, establish a workshop with audio visual screens to improve productivity and visual management, launch of the incentive scheme and working hours management system. Evaluate stage is all about the final results. The results of the entire projects have been phenomenal with increase in labor productivity from 40% to 72.2%, exceeding the target of 70%. The increase in labor productivity contributed to a savings of 5,120,367 dirhams. Increase in vehicle availability from 88% to 95%, which resulted in a savings of 14 million dirhams, with future savings estimated to be in excess of 20 million dirhams. The increase in vehicle availability resulted in extra savings of 8,680,000 dirhams, the elimination of replacement costs of about 40 vehicles. Through best practices in vehicle fleet maintenance, Dubai Police won Trade Benchmarking Proficiency Certificate with Commendation, seven stars, by the Center for Organizational Excellence Research in April 2018, and the Dubai Government Excellence Program, Dubai We Learn Initiative, Another feather in its cap was during the 10th Continual Improvement and Innovation Symposium, Best Practices Management, in which Dubai Police secured first place in service category in November 2018 by Dubai Quality Group. Okay, thank you um, everybody for listening. Uh, Beryl, um, it's over to you now, thank you. Oh, great, okay, thanks Robin. Well, we do have quite a few um, questions, uh, so I shall try and capture find them. Let me see. Okay. So, so Heather was asking a question about what's the most current research showing organizational results from using business excellence frameworks? Um, good question. I don't, I don't know. I found no. I'd need to ask my PhD researcher as, as sard about that. But uh, should, we, should we get back to people if you haven't got the, the, the information yeah, but, right but, again, but again, they can go to that uh, that blog page, which is, we've got all the academic papers in there, and that will show. Well, we've categorised them, so that will that will that will show the latest the latest uh, information. Oh, good. And um, also, um, she asked, what proportion of countries have government funding to support the process? Are you aware of the stats around that, Robin? Um, I would say the the majority have some sort of government funding. Cool. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to say per se, per se, precise stats. I mean, I mean, sometimes it might be directly funding for the, the institution itself. Sometimes it might be based on the programs that they're, they're delivering. Right. So it depends how you sort of collaborate that information. Okay. And Sergio from Costa Rica was asking, is there any information about an average score by country in their assessment evaluation? Uh, no, not really, because again, I think the the... I mean, I'm aware of the different averages of some countries, but again, it becomes problematic because again, it depends how strictly, you know, they, they follow the, the international sort of, sort of, sort of guidelines to that. Um, so, well, for instance, Bangalore would, bang, sorry, Bangladesh would use the, the Bordage framework uh, I don't believe their assessment approach is as rigorous as what you would get in the United States or in New Zealand. So their scores would be higher. Okay, thanks. And um, Bashar was asking an interesting one uh, from Sweden. 
Bashar. He was saying that during the Corona crisis, many decision makers, especially in the government sector, have begun to question why their organizations were unable to survive and deal professionally during the crisis, despite their adoption of one of the business excellence models, um, you know, and quite a few years ago. Yeah, well, I think uh, adopting a business access model is, is obviously going to help. Um, so I think if you looked at, if there were some, some research on that, I would imagine that organisations which are following a business access approach, the likelihood of surviving and, and coming out of this stronger is, 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 is much higher than those not using a business access model because as part of using a business access model, it all is all about you know, business continuity, looking at the risk, uh, the future foresight, et cetera. Um, what is alarming to me is that we don't have governments, you know, governments using the business excellence model because if they did, we would not have this international mess as it is now. Uh, I think uh, most countries were too slow to react to, to COVID because they were not using future foresight, they'd not prepared, they'd not done pr appropriate risk analysis. And I'd, I'd include uh, New Zealand in that too, too, too slow initially. Um, and so every country has been just really firefighting since then, and some countries have done that more effectively than others. Mm. No, good comments, thank you. And uh, here's one that you can probably easier for you to answer right off the cuff uh, from Sergio again. Last week in a presentation we held here in Costa Rica um, with George's participation, some people asked uh, about if in BPIR you can have specific benchmarks for sectors such as insurance, financial, or graphic arts, by example. So can you segment them like that in the BPIR? We will be doing with a new site, but to be honest, uh, that's, that's not a strength of our resource. It's very difficult to, to get that data. So uh, usually trade associations for a particular sector, they, they, they're the organizations which, which have that data. Um, but the, the strength of our resources is more on, on the best practice side. Um, but so with a new website, we'll hopefully, uh, th 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 we, we have got solutions in place that will where we'll develop more relationships with trade associations, organizations which have that, 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 that data so it can be brought into the BPIR. But it's, but it's, it's, it's problematic. Everybody always asks for this data, but it's, it's, it's always difficult to find. And I always question the validity of the data anyway. The data is not gonna help you to improve. It might show you where you are, but it's, but it's not gonna help you to improve. So, it's, so data is good for gap analysis, to set alarm bells ringing, but it doesn't provide solutions. Right. Look, we've got two questions left. If anybody needs to drop off now, we'll understand, but I'll just carry on and ask them. Um, we're only a couple of minutes behind. Because um, there's a really good one here about from Bashar again. How can we restore confidence in the business excellence frameworks of government decision makers, especially in the developing countries that we consult? It's about restoring confidence in BE with government. Where, where's Bashir from? Uh, from Sweden. From Sweden. I, you know, I, I don't, don't know because, I mean, in terms of restoring confidence, I think those countries which have really embraced excellence and have that in, in terms of the, the use, use, use strongly by, by the government entities, I think, they, I think they'll be getting benefits from that. Um, I think... Um, uh, from, from countries which are not see, seeing the benefits is probably because they, they, they've, they've not been, the, the frameworks have not been embedded uh, yep. appropriately. So I think that's, that's mm. a sort of different issue. Yeah, things seem to sort of die off a bit, don't they? And they're not embedded as well as they could be. And if you are asked, there's one last question here, which I think is very relevant for us here in New Zealand. If you are asked to conduct benchmarking for the benefit of the New Zealand government, for example, about government best practices that should be adopted in the future to reduce the effects of any new pandemic, um, what is your plan for this project? If you, know, if you were asked to do that. And I think you just touched on some of the, the work that's been done already. You're already looking at, at some of the, the response. Yeah, we're looking at some of the sub-pillars sub and uh, one, one of the, the areas which is part of the, the crisis management pillar is looking at future preparedness. And uh, so they are already doing benchmarking on that. And uh, again, that's something uh, New Zealand should, should, should be doing so that if, if this happens again, they are, they are better prepared. And 
it's 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 not hard to do it but but, but it's, you, most countries don't seem to do it in a very sort of scientific manager m manner in a systematic ma manner and as i also said previously as well it's not even just doing it systematically you've got to be engaging all the relevant stakeholders so that they believe in um, you know the outputs that come from the, the benchmarking approach so you'd have to engage all the various institutions so that they're part of the program so when you find the best practice everybody agrees that this is the best way to prepare for the future and everybody knows understands that, that solution and, and is ready to go with that solution right well, thanks, Robin. Well, look, I think we're over time and we should wrap this up now. Uh, but thanks very much um, to everybody who has attended the presentation. Uh, we will send out the slides and the um, video, the webinar recording to you. And I would particularly like to thank Robin, of course. Uh, Robin, that was full of great information. And uh, as Heather, I think, said, I'd like to quote her very generous presentation. So thank you for sharing. Thank you very much, okay. everyone. Thank you. Goodbye, Spoli.